Okay. We're online. Okay, so we have Mr. Mitchell, who is our uh, uh, Mary Lynch Elementary Principal, and Mrs. Weisbrook, who is one of our fifth grade teachers. Um, our other fifth grade teacher was not able to be with us today, so we have these two lovely, what, what, what is it you call the kids, your darlings? We have these two lovely darlings to, to help me out today. Um, so what this is for, this whole presentation is for my action research class uh, for my master's degree in curriculum and instruction. And um, the whole idea behind the action research is we, uh, we were given the task of finding, um, basically coming up with a question for how to change something in your room or how to, um, something that you could research and get back results on how you could affect a change in your classroom, whether it was in behavior or academics or anything like that. Um, and I did mine on the fifth grade students and we started, usually we would normally do our ukulele section just in the spring, um, but because this class happened in the fall, we backed it up and we're gonna kind of do half and half. Um, so some of the stuff we would normally do in the fall will move up to the spring and this will just be kind of a, a backwards year. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the main question that I kind of asked was along the lines of motivation. Um, I know that there's always, in, in every class, in every, uh, every activity, there's always some students who are more motivated than others to, uh, to participate, to do well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of see if there was anything I could do to help motivate those students and if that, by motivating them, it would increase the rate at which we were learning on our instrument. Um, so the kids usually use a soprano ukulele. I am gonna have you guys do just a little bit of ukulele playing today so you can kind of get a feel for what the students are asked to do. Um, I will be nice and let you use the tenor ukuleles. They're a little bit bigger. <laughs> it's okay, Tom. it's okay. <laughs> So you want the neck of the instrument, and we'll go over these real quick. But what the, some of what the kids were asked to do was to identify different parts of the ukulele. Um, so they were asked to know the body, which is the main portion, and these are all acoustic. That was actually an acoustic electric, which the kids know that you can plug it in if you want to. Um, but you've got your body, uh, the sound hole, you've got your strings. The back of the portion here is the neck. On top of the neck is your fretboard. The metal portions on top are the frets. Uh, the nut is the portion at the top that holds the strings in their proper spacing. The head is the portion at the top of the neck, as with most things. Um, then we've got tuning pegs. These are machine tuning pegs. And uh, I believe that is all the, oh, the saddle. They had an, uh, wait, no, they did not have to know the saddle, Never mind. Um, so they had to know those portions of the ukulele uh, and that's, uh, those, those were some of their main questions was uh, ukulele anatomy, so to speak. Um, so anyway, this is a soprano ukulele. This is what the kids all play, but for obvious reasons, I usually play a bigger one. That's why I had you guys use those. It's pretty hard to get your fingers situated uh, if you have big hands. So what the kids have to do uh, as far as playing, they, what I was kind of observing them on was the ability to play three different chords. Um, and the chords will, are C major, G7, and if we turn the page a little bit, there it is, their F major chord. Um, normally, the, the technique book, this is the Essential Elements ukulele book. Um, I picked Essential Elements because it lines up with what Mrs. Hyle Smith uses with the band. She uses Essential Elements with all of her band students. So then it's, it's, uh, it's the same thing they're using and there's no confusion because um, everything looks the same. So normally I would teach the C chord, then the F chord, which you saw a couple pages back, and then the G7, just because of how many fingers you have to use and the difficulty of the chords. Uh, for some reason, uh, the book decided, Essential Elements decided they wanted to teach things in a different order, which is fine, but, uh, so it did cause some issues for the kids as far as trying to learn that G7 chord earlier before they had full dexterity in their hands. Um, so anyway, as far as playing the ukulele, the neck goes to the left side, your thumb, the pad of your thumb goes on the back of the neck. And I always tell the kids to make sure they have a really loose uh, loose wrist so they can move easily. 
um, because for some of these chords, you don't necessarily have to move your fingers as long as you twist your hand. You can, I, I always tell the kids, I keep my fingers almost like that 90% of the time because then all I have to do is sit, is sit down and twist my hand and away you go. Um, so anyway, we'll start with our C chord. Uh, I always tell the kids you have two thumbs and you have two pinkies and you have the fingers in between. So we have our thumb and our pinky and then first, second, and third fingers. So your first finger is your pointer finger, second finger is your middle finger, and your ring finger is number three. Um, if you're looking at chord charts, you're looking at as if we were holding the ukulele up straight. So the string we're gonna be using is our bottom string, which is string number one. Uh, you're gonna take your third finger and put it in the space of the third fret. And if you use the tip of your finger and then pinch in between your thumb and third finger. And then all you gotta do is just strum on down. And if you just use, there we go, if you just use the pad of your thumb, I was telling kids you don't want to hit with your, with your fingernail even when you're up strumming. You want to kind of use that meaty part of your thumb. Um, a lot of these, several of these kids uh, know how to play the guitar already. So they immediately wanted me to put a pick in their hand, a plastic pick like you would use on a guitar. And I said, no, we don't use those on a ukulele. So that's your G7, or your C chord. Uh, let's just play four of those in a row, nice and even. One, two, ready, okay. Good, he has excellent rhythm. See, what are you worried about, Karma? That was beautiful. Okay. That's part of my <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Karma and the Carmets. <laughs> you can have the kids accompany you, it'd be great. Um, so anyway, the G7 chord, like I said, is a little more difficult. Uh, from your C chord, if you slide your third finger up one fret to the second fret, then you're going to have your first finger on the second string, first fret, right about there, that's first finger. So you're going to kind of straddle this one. It's harder than it looks, huh? That goes there. Yep, and then this one will go over the top onto the third one. And if you bring your hand forward, the kids have trouble with that a lot too. They try to keep their hand back and then it ends up touching other strings. You wanna bring your hand forward. It feels kind of weird. You're gonna have kind of a hook hand. Uh, but then you can push down from above with your fingers. There we go. And if you just twist your hand a little bit, Karma, out to the outside, then your fingers, I, I always call it, I call that stacking up. I always tell the kids if I say stack up, it means I want two fingers in the same fret. And that's your G7 chord, so let's give her a try. Uh, let's do five this time. One, two, ready, go. Four, five. Excellent, Josh, you're wonderful pupils. It's okay, Carmen, you good tempo. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And then your F chord, um, this one's easy to get to from your G7 where you just were, if you pick up your third finger, it's not gonna do anything, it's irrelevant in this chord and then you take your second finger and move it up one string, then you'll be sitting on your F chord. So five of those, two, ready, go. Excellent. So those are, and I, you can probably see that's why I like going to that chord next, and you don't have to move your third finger to get to your F chord. Uh, if the kids are just playing C and F, they don't actually have to move, they just have to rock their hand back and forth. They don't have to move until they get to G7, or they have to move their third finger, and it gets a little more difficult. So that's why I would normally take that in a different order, but that's the way the, the book decided to go, so. Okay, I won't make you play anymore. <laughs> Excellent job. So anyway, those are the three chords that, the kid, that I kind of uh, used as a baseline for the kids as far as observation. Um, and most, uh, we'll see later on in, some, in one of my graphs that, uh, the kids that, we, uh, with the ukulele, I, I, when I was observ observing whether they could play the chords uh, at the baseline, we did everything in a baseline format, so I gave them their test and, or their survey that I'll show you in a second. Um, then three weeks later, we gave them the same survey, but it was, so it's a benchmark, we figure out where they were. And then three weeks after that, we did a final one, so we kind of can graph how they did over time. Um, and as far as the playing goes, uh, in order for them to be, at the, at the baseline it was 31. 31 out of 31 could not play anything, obviously, because I hadn't taught them anything yet. Um, but by the time we got to the benchmark, I wanna say there was five, 
that could and how I measured those was if they could play those three chords in sequence. Um, the, and usually I had a progression I had them use is C, F, G7, and then back to C. So if they could play those slowly in sequence, then it counted as being able to play those three chords. So, but this is the, so this is the, the book. Jump over now. Okay, so uh, the assessment that we used, I set up a Google form. Um, and it was kind of a mixture of a test and a survey at the same time. Uh, you'll see here each one of these has its own picture and it's a multiple choice test. It's got uh, all of those different things that I talked about as far as ukulele anatomy when we started. Uh, they had all those choices on every single one. And then uh, everyone, so in this one they had to identify part A, which is the body. So it would just be a drop down menu. And I went over and showed them a, a demonstration of how to do it before we went before we actually had to take the survey. So each one has its own thing. And then at the bottom, one thing we didn't go over is the order of, well, we didn't go over with you, we went over with kids, was the order of the strings. Um, it's counterintuitive sometimes. I personally always thought of the strings from top to bottom as I was holding the instrument, whether it's guitar, or ukulele, or whatever. Um, but the, the proper way to think about it is to think of it from the bottom up. Um, so it gets a little confusing, and a lot of the kids are in the same state of mind that I am. Like they want to talk from the top down, so sometimes they get they get mixed up on that one. Uh, the correct one is the A E C G, the number two option, and you'll see we that was one that we had some trouble with as far as getting correct answers. Um, some of the Likert scales that I used, um, I used a four point scale because then they have to pick a side. It's not. <laughs> How many, how many kids do you think would pick the middle just so they didn't have to commit to either agreeing or disagreeing? So we just use a four-point scale. Um, strongly disagree, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or in the middle. Um, so well, the first one is based on confidence. They, they feel confident to identify their parts of the ukulele. Um, I don't know why those are, there's a typo here for some reason, there's some stuff not showing up. Um, but so that was one. Uh, the second one, I personally feel motivated to learn to play the ukulele. So that was how I was measuring. I was getting some feedback on if they felt internally motivated. Um, and then, uh, especially with certain kids later on in the in the process, once some of the kids had already established that they were already personally motivated to do it, then I could start to target some of the kids who were a little lower on the scale. Um, and then the last one was about their perception of what I gave for uh, external motivators in class. Um, and like I said, that's based on their perception. We know some kids need more. We were just talking, we were talking about the fourth grade earlier. Some kids need the carrot in front of them to do anything. And some kids just, just do it. Um, so that's the, that's the quiz that we took. And like I said, we took that as a baseline. Um, so I, I gave them that quiz before we took before I, I taught them anything about the ukulele. There were some kids, um, especially on some of the identification, like uh, on, on A, where you're identifying the body, um, it's a pretty common sense question if you look at the list of things, so a list of answers. So um, there, there were some of those kids, especially since that group, there's quite a few bright ones in it, even though they hadn't played a string instrument before and I hadn't taught them anything about it, some of them picked up on it pretty quick and they figured out some of those answers just by process of elimination. So there were more than I anticipated having correct answers on those right away, but like I said, they just kind of figured it out as they went. So, um, this is an actual research paper. Uh, we, we had to do a, a write-up on uh, the community, the school, and the classroom as far as what our, like in the school, what our demographics were. I think you remember I sent you, I did send yeah. a couple emails over the summer asking demographic questions. That was, that was for this paper. Um, and then I used uh, uh, some census, I used census information as far as uh, the breakdown for the, the county as a whole as far as what the demographics were and the ethnic background. Um, here we have our action plan chart. So the primary question, uh, does extrinsic, mo that sounds strange, do extrinsic motivators increase the learning speed of fifth grade music students when playing the ukulele? That was the basic question. Um, and kind of a secondary tag on question uh, was which type of motivators do children prefer? Um, I, I had 
their, their options if they were given a, a in-class motivation. One would be a Tootsie Roll. I use those because we have so many kids that are allergic to peanuts and there's no peanut oil in those. So they either could get a Tootsie Roll or they could have a new card. What did I do with my new cards? I have them right here. I'll have to find them, I'll show you those later. Um, basically, and I think it was Gage's in your class, right? He's, the, he's actually the only one that cashed his in yet. Um, but it's, it's basically redeemable for 10 minutes of recess time. Gage gave me his and we went outside and played catch with football for a couple minutes. So uh, that's, that's for those kids that they, they might not necessarily want a piece of candy, but they do, some of them do crave that attention aspect. Um, so I, I kind of gave that a try to see if, see if there was preference for one over the other. Um, and yeah, that's, that was right here, the targeted physical reinforcers. So the intangible one was the new card where they could just have the time and then Tootsie Rolls was the tangible one. Um, uh, so teacher, uh, the things, the ways that I would, uh, like the, the, my uh, data points that I used uh, were the Likert scales that we saw in the Google form. Uh, teacher observations are for the actual them being able to play the chords. And then the teacher made test was the bottom portion of the Google form uh, where they had to identify the different parts of people. There, here, Mr. Mitchell. Now we're getting into your your part of the video, not that mice that mouse. Um, so even though I used a four point scale, um, a four point scale on the Likert scales, I combined the agree and disagree. Uh, I combined those into just the agree category because then I could break it down into if they were either agreeing or strongly agreeing that they felt that way. They were, they were in the green for me. I felt they were on the right track. Um, if they were in the disagree category, I listed them as a moderate. They were the yellow ones that they could go either way. And then if they were in the strongly disagree, then that was the red flag ones that I tried to target a little more aggressively. Um, so this was, com this, this scale or this chart is for confidence in their ability to play or identify the parts of the ukulele. So this is the, their, their perception of whether they could identify correctly or not. Um, less than 50% the first time felt that they could, um, but then you see, I mean, as we go along with the benchmark and the final, you see that, that spike in the kids that are feeling confident in it. Uh, for some reason, and this happens in, I believe, two to three separate, um, separate questions, for some reason we see a decrease in the disagreeing, uh, to the benchmark and then there's a spike again at the end. Um, I usually, with, with this many kids, I, I'm kind of using a margin of error with one to two students um, because, you know, maybe maybe somebody just came in one, you know, maybe when they came in on the final day, they just had had it with that day and they were just in a bad mood and they decided they were gonna disagree with something. So I always leave a little bit of room room for error there, but where there's a 12 student hike, I feel that's a big enough increase to kind of <laughs> kind of say what something is going on. Uh, so that was the uh, identifying portions of the ukulele. This one was the, the motivation that, that we were talking about this earlier. Um, as far as they feel personally motivated to learn to play this instrument, um, there wasn't really a ton of room for growth on this one because 25, that's, I believe that's about 82% thereabouts, um, marked as they were already motivated to do it and I hadn't done, any, done anything yet. So, um, what was, it, this is another one, like I said, that was a little interesting to me because um, the first, in between the baseline and the benchmark, I didn't do any, no candy, no, no external stuff like that. You know, they, they were given praise if they were doing well, but uh, as far as actual physical things, they weren't given anything as a reward for doing well. So in that in that time frame, we saw that spike in uh, in agreeing that they were motivated to do it. Uh, but then we see a couple more kids show up in the strongly disagree section at the end, um, which again could be within that margin error. Maybe we just had a couple kids that had a bad day. Um, another another thing that I kind of have a, 
a hunch on about that. As you guys saw, sometimes it's hard to get your fingers to do what they're supposed to do. That's kind of why I wanted to do that. There's, you know, there's some kids uh, that, you know, there's there's two or three of them that play the guitar already, and they can just sit there and play till the cows come home, and it's no big deal. Uh, there's some kids that I almost have to physically move their fingers every single time we set a new chord. And it's, I mean, it's just a tricky instrument to do. Once they kind of get their muscles built up in their fingers, it'll get a lot easier. Uh, so that I, I feel that that might be the, the little spike in disagree, or strongly disagree at our final survey. I think that might have been due to some frustration on some individuals' parts, too. So that's kind of my hunch there. Um, our last Likert scale, uh, the provided classroom reinforcements. Again, I, I wasn't necessarily giving any, but uh, you know, that's 90% of the students, 88% of the students already thought I was giving good in-class reinforcements, so uh, there wasn't a ton of room for growth on that. But again, there's there's a slight decrease and then an increase at the end. Um, so again, it could be it could be due to frustration, it could be due to those kids just having a bad day. But where it's only a one to two student thing, um, you know, there's there's always going to be some variations. Okay. We move into um, our different, the next nine charts are all about identification of the different parts of the ukulele body. Uh, on four of these charts, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, there was an increase in both surveys. Um, so they, just like this one, we went up to the baseline and benchmark and we added another one on the final. There are several I believe there's five, so maybe it's three, three increased both times. Five of them did just what this one does. We have an increase to the benchmark, and then we're stagnant when it gets to the final. Um, and that was with identification of the bridge. And then we have, I believe, two that do what we had. We had here. We go up on up to the benchmark, and then we for some reason come back down on the final. Um, I'm I'm really curious if I, I, I believe that this is probably due to a student guessing on one of them and having to have guessed it right on this one and then forgot what they guessed the previous time and ended up guessing the wrong one on the next one um, you know if it, because there are you know there are, there are a few students in every class that always tend to struggle a little bit and those those are the low-end kids that I'm targeting but um, I'm, I'm guessing that was one of those why we had that lower end of there. Um, again, increase and increase when they're identifying the frets. Um, that one, where we, we talk about the frets all the time when you're playing it because every single thing that you do has to do with the frets. So they get, they get that one kind of pounding into their head on a regular basis. Um, what do we have here? Oh, identification of the nut. This one was a little more difficult. Um, I think probably because of what we're actually talking about. When, when most of these kids think of a nut, they think like a, like a hex nut. And we're talking about a, a straight piece of plastic on the top of the ukulele. So they just don't, in their mind, put those, they don't put two and two together, that, that should, that's what that's called. Um, so this one, there was a little more variation. Again, I, I think this one was just due to guessing uh, by the kids that didn't know why there was variation. Uh, tuning keys, they get talked to about this almost every day that they play to, because uh, when they get their ukuleles out and when they put them away, I always remind them not to touch their tuning keys because I tune them before we hand them out so they're all in tune, and if they mess with them, then things start sounding bad. Uh, head of the ukulele, again, I don't know why there was a decrease in this section. Um, this is one of them that a lot of those kids got right the first time just out of um, out of intuition, and, uh, and it w which it was within that that two student uh, margin of error that I was I was talking about earlier, but still um, the neck increase increase that one's another one of those that's pretty uh, pretty intuitive. Uh, this is what I was talking about with the identifying the strings in the correct order. Most of them want to read those strings in the opposite order than they actually show up. Um, so this one was was kind of a wash, uh, and I, it, it's something that I need to go back to when we get into the spring and start working on ukuleles. I need to, to really work on making sure that they understand which string is which, because we'll end up doing more 
we'll do more chord playing, but we'll also do actual note playing, and to do that, they have to understand which string they're playing on, as far as notes go. And then, back to being able to play their chords, like I said, they have to play these chords in this sequence and back to C. Um, they don't, I, I, it's nice and slow, usually I give them about 60 beats a minute, which is about gay fast, and they usually get two beats per chord, so they have to do strum, strum, strum. So they have a good portion of time to switch their hands, but it does have to be uh, pretty steady on the tempo. If they, if they get outside of that tempo range and start having trouble, then, then I would not count that as, as being able to accurately. So these 12, those are, I mean, these five are the students that um, either have, I believe there's at least three of them that take uh, guitar lessons, and then there's another two that are just extremely musical. And those are those five that, that showed up first. And then the, as they learned their chords, um, I've got a couple of them trained pretty well that once they know what they're doing, if there's somebody around them that has a question, to help that person if I can't get to them right away because maybe I'll be over here working with somebody else. And so those five are very good at working with um, with the people around them to help make sure that they're playing the correct thing. And that, of course, brought everybody else up around them. So we'll continue working on the on the chords. Uh, like, like you guys saw earlier, it's not, not necessarily the easiest thing. Once you uh, once you get the hang of it, it's not all that difficult, but it does take some, some dexterity with your hands. And that's the end of my charts anyway. So my conclusion, um, I mean, we just kind of went through the results. My conclusion was that based on the, uh, based on the results from the Likert scale as far as their, what the kids were responding for, whether they were motivated and whether I was giving good in-class reinforcements and those sort of things. Um, like I said, there were so many kids, even from right at the first, that marked it very high. So I don't necessarily know as so with this particular class, we need to change anything at this point. Um, we're, we're asked to do a recommendation going forward, and I recommended that as far as motivational strategies that we pretty much keep with what we're doing with this class. Um, as I was talking to Mike earlier, I, I might try some of these same things with the class below them um, because we've had some, some behavior issues and some motivation issues in that class. Um, so that might be something that I try going forward uh, to see if it if it affects different classes differently, which I'm sure it will. Um, do you guys have questions? Pretty straightforward. Did you like my graphs, Mr. Mitchell? Were they they did. Were he they did. professional? He, he, yeah, they looked nice. He did understand. Uh, the ones that you got the red primarily, I mean, they've come down, but those are things that are going to take. A long period of time. I keep going back to my coaching. That's those specialty position things. Mm -hmm. it, it's the same thing. I mean, putting it all, putting it all together. Do you have any questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to listen to me. Yeah. And we'll continue working forward. And you're right on that class with the kids during their final piece when you have the variation of numbers. Something that happened before you got here or on the way to class. Well, yeah, we, 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 we both know there's some of, or all three of us know there's some of those kids that they come in and they might have a, their fuse has already been lit for the morning and it's going to mess up the whole day no matter what you do. And <laughs> so, like I said, I, I think that some of those were, were kind of based on those sorts of things. Oh, you did a good job. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for coming and listening. Yeah.